Hey everyone, this is your lecture on airway medications. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to be sharing the drug information tables as well as some information from the textbook. So I will share with you, before I send out this recording, I'm gonna share with you kind of an outline. Um, but if you wanna follow along on the drug information tables, that's what I'm going to share with you on the screen and you'll be able to just follow along and highlight. And then I'm gonna highlight some important points um, as well. So if you wanna go ahead and pause this video for a moment, grab the drug information tables for your airway medications, and then come back and begin the lesson. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we're gonna start with the beta-2 adrenergic agonist, and this is probably one of the most common respiratory medications that you are going to see, and this is albuterol. Brand name is Provenil or Venolin, but generally we just call it albuterol. This is the short-acting beta-2 adrenergic agonist that we use most frequently. There are also long-acting forms of this type of drug, and the long-acting forms are salmeterol and formoterol. Um, the long-acting beta agonist, you may see sometimes abbreviated as LABA, long-acting beta agonist, LABA, um, and albuterol is the short-acting. So what these beta agonists do is they stimulate the beta receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle. And when it does that, it causes bronchodilation. So this is a sympathetic response. Remember the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight system, when we stimulate the beta receptors, it causes bronchodilation to let more airway or to let more air into the airways. So some of the adverse effects, if you think about a sympathetic stimulation, the adverse effects are tachycardia, palpitations. Um, if the person has any type of cardiovascular disease, it may actually cause angina, and that's all from the sympathetic stimulation. It can also cause some shakiness or, tremor, or tremors, uh, and again, that's because of the stimulation of those beta receptors on the skeletal muscles. It can also cause uh, hyperglycemia. Again, it's a sympathetic response. It can cause hyperglycemia, so we have to be careful about diabetic patients. These drugs are administered by inhalation using a metered dose inhaler or a dry powder inhaler or a nebulizer. So review your fundamentals information on how to use those systems of delivery. The short acting albuterol is used for acute asthma attacks. So if somebody is having a asthma attack, we use the short acting albuterol. The long acting form salmeterol and formeterol are used for controlling long-term asthma. It's not used for acute attacks. A point to note here, and I don't, I'm just reading over this paper here, but I don't see it on here. So here's an important point to write down. If the client is taking both the, both a beta adrenergic agonist like albuterol and a glucocorticoid, which is a steroid, and we'll talk about that coming up here. If they're taking both of those together, we want to give this bronchodilator first, give the bronchodilator first, this beta-2 adrenergic agonist first, and then give the steroid. And what that does is it allows the bronchodilator to work and then enhance the absorption of the glucocorticoid. Okay, so we give the bronchodilator first, allow it to work, and then we give the steroid. All right, and then how do we evaluate effectiveness? Do I have that on here? No, I don't. How do we evaluate effectiveness if somebody's having asthma? Obviously, we want to evaluate the long-term control of the asthma, um, their reduced frequency of asthma exacerbation, uh, the absence of shortness of breath, clear breath sounds, the absence of wheezing, make sure the respiratory rate is at baseline, uh, an improved pulse ox reading, decreased work of breathing, um, the client verbalizes that it's easier to breathe. All of that goes under um, client instructions and evaluate, well, really not under client instructions, it's more like evaluation, right? So we're evaluating the effectiveness of these drugs. Some interactions down here. 
I'll come back to contraindications. Um, interactions, we want to avoid other stimulants like uh, caffeine or CNS stimulants. Beta blockers will negate the effects of these drugs because we're stimulating the beta receptors. So if we give drugs that block the beta receptors, they're gonna kind of cancel each other out. MAOIs and tricyclics will increase the risk of hypertension, tachycardia, and angina. And then remember I said it causes hyperglycemia, so hypoglycemic drugs, anti-diabetic drugs, may be required to have an increased dosing because this drug will cause an increase in blood sugar. So we may need to increase the dose of anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, for contraindications, obviously if they have an allergy to the drug, but also you can add on there if the client has a history of tachydysrhythmias, we wanna be very cautious giving this drug because it's going to cause tachydysrhythmias. Anybody with hypertension, angina, hyperthyroidism, remember that speeds up your metabolism. So if we're giving this drug that causes an increase in heart rate and sympathetic stimulation, we wanna be very cautious in who we're going to give it to if they already have a, a pre-existing condition that's going to cause that. Okay, so that is albuterol. And if you've ever had asthma, if you've ever had an asthma attack and taken albuterol, you know it makes your heart race, it makes you very shaky. And that, that's a common expected side effect. It is an adverse effect, but it's a common expected adverse effect. And it usually wears off within about an hour. All right, the next drug is an inhaled anticholinergic drug called Ipratropium. Brand name is Atrovent. And it's an anticholinergic, right? So you should already have an idea of kind of what it does. So this drug is given for the relief of bronchoconstriction in clients who have COPD. We also give it for uh, as an adjunct with asthma attacks, but that's an off-label use. That's not exactly what it's prescribed for, but we still use it for uh, as an off-label use in conjunction with other um, asthma meds. Like usually we'll, in the ER, we'll give albuterol and atrovent, but technically that's an off-label use. So technically it's supposed to be only used for um, COPD, the relief of uh, bronchoconstriction in, POS, in COPD. Um, and this is an anticholinergic, so it blocks the acetylcholine in the bronchial smooth muscles. Um, so adverse effects, local anticholinergic effects. So local effects, we are inhaling an anticholinergic, so it's going to cause dry mouth, irritation of the pharynx. Um, but the systemic effect, those are the most common effects, the dry mouth and the, the irritated throat, maybe some hoarseness. Um, less common are those other two that you see there, increased intraocular pressure and urinary retention. Um, it can also cause um, headaches and blurred vision, nosebleed. Those are less common side effects. Um, it can also less commonly cause bronchospasm, but again, much less common. The most common side effect that you're going to see is dry mouth and irritation of the throat. Um, and for interventions, again, it's those um, common uh, anticholinergic interventions, sips of water, hard candies for them to suck on. This drug is administered by inhalation. So review how to administer uh, using a meter dose inhaler or a nebulizer or an uh, inhaler with a spacer. This drug is not for acute attacks. This is for long-term control, so it's not for acute uh, COPD exacerbations. Usually the dose is two puffs, so make sure they're waiting between, uh, between the puffs, um, however many minutes the prescriber says. And then if the patient is prescribed more than one inhaler, make sure they're waiting at least five minutes between inhalations. Um, and make sure to tell them that they rinse their mouth out between uses just to reduce that unpleasant taste.
contraindications, um, any hypersensitivity to the, the drug or atropine, belladonna or bromides, those are anticholinergics as well. And again, anybody that may be sensitive to anticholinergics, we have to be cautious, glaucoma, prostatic hypertrophy, bladder neck obstruction, again, because of the possibility of systemic urinary issues. And in our actions, it has their beta-2 adrenergic agonist may enhance bronchodilation. So that's the interaction that we want. Like I said, we sometimes use it with albuterol because it enhances the action. So that's a good interaction sometimes when we want to give it for somebody with asthma. All right, the next drug is theophylline. This is a methylxanthine called theophylline. We don't use this drug a whole lot anymore because it has some serious side effects, but it's given for the long-term management of chronic asthma. So this drug um, can, it has, uh, we have to monitor the blood levels of this drug and the side effects can be serious at toxic levels. So, and there's better drugs available. So that's why we don't use it a whole lot. Um, so adverse reactions are rare when it's therapeutic, but they're really bad when they're toxic. So, and like I said, there's safer drugs out there. So we just don't use it a whole lot. Um, so they can cause the, the toxic levels can cause restlessness uh, mild toxicity can be restlessness, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but severe toxicity can result in dysrhythmias and seizures. So that can be really bad. So we need to monitor drug levels. We need to monitor serum theophylline levels. We need to discontinue the drug if toxic levels are indicated. And then we would give activated charcoal and monitor their heart rate. Um, we can give something like lidocaine, which is an anti-dysrhythmic to restore their, um, their heart rhythm. Um, if they're having seizures, then we would institute seizure precautions, maybe give them benzos if they're actually seizing, things like that. So this, it, it, it's a serious drug. We can give it orally for long-term management in the ER and critical care settings, and we can give it IV. As far as administration, we don't want to double up on any doses. Um, we don't want the client to chew enteric coated tablets again, because it would be released too quickly. Um, and we want to maintain their doses as prescribed. The big contraindication here is caffeine. So the client needs to be instructed to eliminate caffeine, reduce or eliminate caffeine, because if you look down here, it should be under interactions, um, caffeine increases the risk of toxicity. So caffeine, cimetidine, and fluoroquinolones, that's an antibiotic, they all increase the risk of toxicity. So the client needs to be instructed to reduce or eliminate caffeine from their diet. Um, and anybody with impaired liver or kidney function, obviously, and also tobacco or marijuana use can um, impair metabolism, should be used in with precautions in somebody with heart disease, obviously because the risk of dysrhythmias, liver dysfunction, and acute pulmonary edema. Um, phenobarbital, dilantin, or phenotone, Dilantin and nicotine increase metabolism of theophylline. So the nicotine there, that's why they need to um, not smoke if they're on this medication and the risk for seizures with the phenobarbital and uh, phenotoin increases the metabolism of theophylline. So it's a, it's a risky drug. So that's why we don't use it a whole lot. Okay. So in terms of client education, they also need to, the client needs to be notified that they're going to have their blood level, levels drawn they need to be notified uh, or they need to be educated regarding possible side effects. You know, if they have increased restlessness or obviously if they're experiencing seizures or um, heart palpitations or anything abnormal, they need to report it to their um, uh, healthcare provider right away. If they're having any GI distress, because that's an early sign of toxicity, notify their healthcare provider right away. Okay. So that's the alphalin. The next drug is the glucocorticoids. So these are steroids. 
And we have two types here. We have the inhaled steroids and the oral steroids. We also have the nasal steroids, but they don't have very many side effects, just some local side effects. So we're gonna mention them kind of quickly. So the inhaled steroids are beclomethasone and the oral steroids are prednisone. The steroids usually end in SONE, S-O-N-E, or SOLONE. Um, and basically what they do as a, as a group, as a class, <clears throat> they all decrease inflammation. They all decrease inflammation, they suppress mucus production, and they reduce edema. And these drugs are not for acute attacks. Uh, Long-term oral therapy can be used for severe chronic asthma. The short-term oral therapy, short-term is like 10 days, um, can be used for symptoms following an acute attack. So if you have an asthma attack, you go to the ER, you get treated, they'll probably discharge you with a prescription for like 10 days of prednisone. Um, we can use short-term IV therapy with uh, IV steroids for something like status asthmaticus. Um, and then we can also use long-term inhaled steroids for uh, the prophylaxis uh, in asthma management to reduce the frequency and severity of asthma attacks. But basically remember steroids decrease the immune response. They decrease inflammation. They suppress the release of leukotrienes and prostaglandins and histamines. And all those three, the leukotrienes, the prostaglandins, and the histamines, they all mediate inflammation. And they prevent the action, uh, steroids prevent the action of white blood cells. So these effects increase the longer the steroids are taken. So the more we suppress the immune response, the more side effects the client is going to have. So here are some of the adverse drug reactions. So let's talk about the inhaled steroids first. Um, hoarseness is one and oral candidiasis or thrush. Another name for that is thrush. I'm gonna come back up here in just a minute, but let's look at oral. So what do we wanna do for somebody who's taking oral uh, inhaled steroids? We want to give them a, a inhaler with a spacer. We want to make sure that they rinse their mouth and the spacer after they use their, their inhaler. And we want to make sure that they know how to monitor and assess their mouth, look in their mouth and look for any redness or white patches and make sure they report those redness or white patches to their healthcare provider. But the biggest thing is making sure that they rinse their mouth and their inhaler after each use and look for any white patches or redness or sores in their mouth. And if they need, we can give them uh, antifungal therapy for that thrush. Okay. Now the oral or the PO steroids, this is going to have some more um, systemic effects, especially the longer that they're on it. So there's a whole bunch of them here. The oral medications are going to suppress the adrenal function. And they do that because we are now replacing the steroids in the body with the pills. So the adrenal, the adrenal glands are kind of like, oh, well, the, there's already steroids in the blood, so I don't need to work because it's already there. It's kind of like that feedback loop. So they kind of go to sleep. They're like, well, we don't need to do anything because the steroids are already there. So they just kind of, you know, take a nap because they're not needed. The problem is if we stop giving the steroids, the adrenal glands are asleep. And then if we stop it abruptly, then suddenly we can go into adrenal crisis because we have no steroids in the, in the body. So steroids always need to be tapered so that we give a chance, we give those adrenal glands a chance to wake up. So this is a drug that prednisone, any kind of, of steroid is definitely a drug that we want to taper slowly to give those adrenal glands a chance to wake back up and take over. So even a 10 day dose, you've probably seen something called a Medrol dose pack. That drug, we need to, um, it tapers off dose, uh, slowly. It starts with like six pills a day, then five pills, then four, then three, then two, then one. That gives the adrenal glands a chance to wake up and start producing their, um, their steroids again. So again, it suppresses adrenal function. Um, steroids can cause bone demineralization and muscle wasting. 
which can lead to osteoporosis and bone fractures. Again, the longer it's on it. a five day or a 10 day supply of prednisone is probably not going to do that. But if you're taking inhaled uh, steroids for months and months and months to control COPD or chronic asthma or chronic bronchitis, then that might be a problem. Um, can definitely cause hyperglycemia, so it's especially a problem for diabetic clients. Um, peptic ulcer disease can cause infection and poor wound healing, can cause fluid and electrolyte imbalances, um, especially hypokalemia. Uh, fluid imbalance, including fluid retention and edema. It can cause, um, I don't see it on there, but it can also cause weight gain. Uh, weight gain and increased appetite and insomnia. And these last two on here are related to the nasal spray uh, steroids, which can cause dry mucous membranes. Epistaxis is the term for nosebleed, sore throat, and headache. So the intervention for the orals, that's the ones in the middle here, these middle ones. Um, again, taper the dose, don't stop it abruptly. We want to monitor for signs of bone demineralization. I'm not really sure what they mean by that. How are you gonna monitor for signs? Muscle wasting, it's, that's, that's pretty vague. Um, Monitor your glucose levels, especially in clients with diabetes. Have, they may have to check their blood sugars more frequently. They may need their uh, drugs, their insulin or hypoglycemic drugs um, adjusted. The observe for GI bleeding, especially uh, black tarry stools, or if they start vomiting, they observe for any blood. You can give the drugs with food or meals. And avoid NSAIDs. I think this is going to be in the interactions at the, the end, but avoid NSAIDs because that can um, also cause GI bleeding. Watch for signs of infection because it can um, lower their immune system. It suppresses their immune system, so sore throat, fatigue, fever. Um, look, look at their wounds. It promotes uh, or it inhibits wound healing, so be careful about their wounds. And weight gain can be a sign of fluid retention. And generalized weakness may indicate hypokalemia. So hypokalemia is something to watch out for. And so monitor their electrolytes, okay? As far as administration, again, the, the inhaled steroids are not used for acute attacks. And I said this before with the, with albuterol, with the beta agonists, when you're using a beta agonist and a glucocorticoid, you give the beta agonist bronchodilator first, let the airways dilate for a minute or two, and then use the steroid, then use the glucocorticoid. The oral steroids, usually they're short term, five to 10 days for, for long term use. Usually it's once a day or alternate day dosing, and then you need to taper the dose slowly when you're either going off of it or to the lowest dose possible to avoid the, to avoid the um, side effects. During times of illness, you may actually need more because the body's under stress. All right, I think that's about it for those. Now let's talk about the leukotriene modifiers. This is Montelukast or Singular. All the drugs in this class end in Lukast. This ending here, Lukast. So this is a pill. This is not an inhaled drug, this is a pill. And these drugs suppress the effects of leukotrienes and reduce inflammation, bronchoconstriction, airway edema, and mucus production. So that's what they do. Adverse effects are not too terrible, uh, or I shouldn't, they're not, not that they're not terrible, they're not too many, um, but what they are are significant. Um, 
liver damage from the first two, Zolutan and Zephyrlucast, cause liver damage. The Montelukast, not so much. Um, there have been reports of suicidal ideations, um, but they are infrequent. But as far as the other side effects, there's not too many. As far as administration goes, the Montelukast uh, or Singular is given once in the day, once daily in the evening. If it's given for bronchospasm, you can take it two hours before exercising. And then it gives you some, um, some ways to mix it and things like that, but I wouldn't worry about, you know, um, memorizing that too much. I don't think we would, we wouldn't give you a, a question about how to mix it with applesauce or carrots or something like that. As far as client instructions, those are geared towards looking at the side effects. So if there's any abdominal tenderness, nausea, or anorexia, that's looking for liver failure, uh, behavior changes, agitation, insomnia, or anxiety, that's looking for those um, neuro, neuropsychiatric changes. And contraindications, you're looking at um, any liver dysfunction, and this is not for acute asthma, it's not for status asthmaticus. This is for long-term prophylaxis, not for acute attacks. So far, the only one we've had for acute attacks is albuterol. Or, um, yeah, albuterol, that was the only one. All right, and some interactions, phenobarbital, rifampin, uh, phenytoin, you may need higher doses with those. All right, that's it for the Montelukast uh, leukotriene modifiers. All right, antihistamines are divided into two generations, first generation, second generation. First generation is, we've talked about this drug a lot, Benadryl is the most common one, promethazine, uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl is the first one, promethazine is the other one. So first generation antihistamines have a lot more side effects. So these have more significant side effects, um, basically anticholinergic effects and sedation. So we've talked about this drug a lot. And those are the main side effects, drowsiness, dizziness, and anticholinergic effects. And I feel like you already know what those are, right? You should know what the interventions are by now. Uh, as far as administration, don't crush your true enteric-coated formulas. Um, avoid alcohol or other CNS depressants. That makes sense, right? Um, certain ones, Benadryl, not really, but certain ones can be taken for motion sickness, so taking 30 minutes to two hours before motion sickness. Uh, instructions, those all make sense, right? Take the drug before bedtime because it's going to cause sedation avoid driving, hard candies with food, blah, blah, blah. We, you know that already. You guys know this, you know it. All right, contraindications should not be given to new, newborns and children under two years um, because it can cause the opposite effect. It can cause uh, anxiety, uh, irritability, hyperactivity, and it can become toxic very easily in small children. Um, breastfeeding women because the sedation can be passed on to the infant. Okay, also glaucoma, prostatic hypertrophy, and acute asthma exacerbation. We don't want to um, cause any problems with those. All right, older adults and children, again, they can have that opposite reaction, and all the rest of them, they are all um, anticholinergic precaution patients, right? Interactions, all those CNS depressants, alcohol, CNS depressants, anything that's going to interact with those anticholinergic and sedating um, effects. So I feel like you guys already know this. All 
Um, the other thing I want to add that's, that I don't see on here is theophylline can reduce the excretion of antihistamines, which, can, which means if it reduces the excretion of antihistamines, that means the more antihistamines will uh, accumulate in the body and can lead to toxicity. All right, so what does toxicity look like? Acute toxicity of these first generation antihistamines looks like excitation, hallucinations, ataxia, incoordination. It can cause seizures in children, uh, fever, tachycardia, urinary retention, uh, pupil dilation. Um, everything's hyped up. To, it's basically an anticholinergic overdose. Uh, that's acute toxicity. And especially the, the, in IV forms, like we can give diphenhydramine IV, it can cause, because of the sedation, it can cause respiratory depression. So just be aware of that. Now the second generation non-sedating antihistamines uh, are things like what we commonly think of as allergy pills, like sertirazine, which is Zyrtec, loratadine, things like that. Those are the non-sedating antihistamines. So they don't cause as many side effects, but the side effects are kind of the same, drowsiness and fatigue, normally in higher doses, and less anticholinergic effects, but they're still possible. So the same things still apply. You just have to be um, aware. So less sedation, mild anticholinergic effects. Uh, you can expect the dose to be lower in clients who have compromised renal or liver function. That just makes sense. The dose is usually once a day. Um, generally in the evening if there's going to be any kind of sedation, but again, it's usually pretty, pretty mild. All right, and again, there's your note about theophylline and other CNS depressants. All right, let's talk about sympathomimetics. These are decongestants. So these are listed on your, um, not your blueprint, your detailed course outline as decongestants, but they're also called sympathomimetics because they mimic the sympathetic nervous system response. So these are things like phenylephrine, pseudoephedrine, and ephedrine. So neosinephrine, pseudofed, um, commonly found in over-the-counter cold medicine. And we give these to reduce nasal congestion. Again, it mimics the effect of the central nervous system and causes vasoconstriction of the blood vessels in the nose, which relieves nasal congestion. The topical ones, the sprays work very quickly, um, but again, the systemic absorption can have adverse effects, especially if the client has cardiovascular problems. So sympathomimetic, think CNS stimulation, especially with the PO version, so anxiety, agitation, insomnia, increased blood pressure, tachycardia, palpitations. Um, toxicity or overdose can look like hypertension, tachycardia, tachydysrhythmias. Um, that's a real problem, especially if somebody already has a history of hypertension or cardiovascular disease. In the nasal sprays or the topical application, prolonged use can result in what we call rebound congestion. So they have a need to continue using the drug in order to get relief of the congestion. So our interventions are to monitor for those CNS effects, those, the agitation, the anxiety, the insomnia. Um, we may need to give them something for sleep, monitor their vitals, um, only give it when needed. And for the, the rebound congestion, they may need something like a steroid to minimize the symptoms while they're being weaned off that, um, the phenylephrine for nasal congestion to get rid of that rebound congestion. So we definitely don't want to exceed the recommended dose because of the, the possibility of um, adverse effects. And the topical decongestions no longer than three to five days because of that rebound congestion.
We want to, as far as client instructions, we don't want to, or sorry, we want to educate the clients about the CNS stimulation. We also want to let them know, I don't see it written on here. We also want to let them know to read any over-the-counter medications that they're taking because some of these cold compounds contain multiple ingredients and they may interact with each other. So one cold medicine may have phenylephrine and another may have ephedrine. And if they take them both together, then they're gonna have additive CNS stimulation effects. Um, obviously we wanna have them report any side effects, have their blood pressure checked no longer than three to five days. And then this taper and discontinue the drug using one nostril at a time, that's about the rebound congestion. The contraindications, these are important. The uncontrolled heart disease, dysrhythmias, or hypertension, we're basically giving them a drug that increases their heart rate and increases their blood pressure. So if they have any kind of uncontrolled heart disease or dysrhythmia or hypertension, we could really cause some problems with these, with these drugs. And obviously we wanna use caution in clients with coronary artery disease, hypertension, and older adults. In the interactions, these make sense, right? MAOIs can potentiate the effects. Remember, MAOIs can cause hypertensive crisis. So we wanna make sure that we don't use it within three weeks uh, of them going off of an MAOI because we don't wanna cause hypertension. And then the beta agonists and other stimulants can potentiate the hypertensive effects. Remember, the, the albuterol that we gave to the client with asthma is also going to cause tachycardia and hypertension. So we don't want to give the, this class of drugs on top of it. That just makes sense. All right, the next class is antitussives. Uh, tuss, this middle part of the word here, tussive, just refers to cough. So these are anti-cough medicines. And there's two categories here. One is opioids and the other is non-opioids. So both of these classes of cough suppressants suppress the cough reflex in the brain, but we only want to give it to suppress coughs that are non-productive coughs. So chronic non-productive coughs. If the client is coughing up a lot of mucus, we want to let them cough that up and get it out. So these are only for chronic non-productive coughs. So Codeine is the opioid cough uh, antitussive that we're going to talk about. And dextromethorphan is the non-opioid. So Delsin is the brand name or Robitussin is dextromethorphan. So uh, codeine, opioids, uh, they, opioids are CNS depressants. So they cause drowsiness and sedation. Uh, they can cause lightheadedness. The most common almost every client that gets this, the most common effect of codeine is nausea and sometimes vomiting, but almost everybody that takes codeine gets nauseous. Um, opioids also cause constipation uh, and they can also cause respiratory depression. The dextromethorphan, the non-opioids can also cause some drowsiness, but less than the opioids and usually only at higher doses. They can also cause GI distress, but again, not as much as the codeine. And with both classes, the opioids and the non-opioids, there is a potential for abuse. So if you may have noticed, dextromethorphan is no longer on the shelves. It's actually behind the shelves because of the potential for abuse. So kids have found that you can um, abuse dextromethorphan um, and get high off of uh, big doses of it. So they now put it in the back with the Sudafed um, and lock it up. So you have to ask for it and show ID when you check out of the grocery store. So nice. Anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so there's potential for abuse, not just with the opioids, but also with the dextromethorphan. So interventions, they make sense when you think about the CNS depression. Obviously, um, either monitor if they're in the hospital or on your floor, monitor the clients when changing positions or ambulating. Um, for the GI distress, the, you can give the drug with food or milk. For the constipation, encourage uh, fluids and uh, diet with 
uh, increased fiber, they may need a stool softener, it causes respiratory depression, so you want to monitor respirations. If their respiratory rate falls below 12, you want to stimulate breathing. If they OD on codeine, it is an opioid, so you can reverse it with Narcan. And we want to give the drug only when it's needed. We don't want to give it any longer than needed or any more frequently than needed. So in terms of administration, they both should be given on a short-term basis and at the lowest effective dose. And again, only when it's needed. In terms of client instructions, give them you know, all your instructions about um, changing positions slowly or gradually when they're feeling lightheaded, avoiding other CNS depressants like alcohol when they're taking the codeine, um, don't drive or, you, or perform activities that require mental alertness, food or milk, lie down when they feel nauseous, increase fluid and fiber, Again, only when needed on a short-term basis, and then remove triggers that precip precipitate coughing from the environment if, if possible. And your contraindications, obviously a known sensitivity to the drug. There are, um, it's, it's not uncommon to have a client allergic to codeine. That's a pretty common one. MAOIs and SSRIs, prostatic hypertrophy, those are contraindications, somebody taking, taking those drugs or who have prostatic hypertrophy. Anybody with a reduced respiratory reserve, so somebody who has chronic respiratory um, issues like uh, emphysema or chronic asthma, the opioids will suppress respiration. So you have to be very careful in giving somebody like that opioids. Obviously somebody with a history of substance abuse, we wanna avoid opioids and then use cautiously in children and older adults because of their uh, decreased metabolism and excretion. All right, and then interactions, opioids, alcohol, CNS depressants, and St. John's wort all increase CNS depression. And non-opioid antitussives increase the analgesic effects of opioids. All right, so that all kind of goes together. All right, guys, we're almost done. We got two left. All right, expectorants. So this one is guaifenesin. That's how I pronounced it. Some people pronounce it differently, but I learned it as guaifenesin. Um, Mucinex is the brand name. This drug, an expectorant, this class of drug increases and thins mucus secretions to allow the client to decrease chest congestion by coughing out their secretions. So it thins everything out and then allows the client to cough it out. So some of the adverse effects, they're not terrible. Maybe some dizziness, some drowsiness or a headache, um, GI distress, um, maybe some nausea, maybe some diarrhea an allergic reaction. But again, they're mild and they're not very common. So what do we wanna do in terms of um, interventions and administration? For intervention, we want to encourage fluids because we want to thin out those secretions. So give the drug with a full glass of water or food and encourage fluids of at least 1,500 to 2,000 milliliters daily. If they have any kind of dizziness, obviously we're going to watch them when they're ambulating. Uh, in terms of administration, obviously we wanna monitor if the cough gets worse or they develop a fever. We only want to give the drug when it's needed. And this drug, I'm just looking to see if it's written here because I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Um, we want to notify the provider if the cough lasts more than a week. So this drug really shouldn't be given for chronic cough that lasts more than a week. Something more than a, a simple cold is going on if, it's more, if they're taking this drug for more than a week. So anything more than a week, uh, they need to call their provider. This formulation does contain alcohol. So remember the drug disulfiram that was for um, alcohol abstinence um, that interacts. It causes that acetaldehyde syndrome. It contains alcohol, so they will have a, an alcohol reaction. So we need to be aware if they are on that 
that drug disulfiram. It also contains uh, sugar. So if they're diabetic, they need to be aware um, and aspartame because of the PKUs. So just be aware that that may be an issue for clients with those issues. All right, but not a whole lot with that drug. All right, and then the last drug, almost done, woohoo, is acetylcysteine. We already talked about acetylcysteine a little bit, but this is a mucolytic. So this decreases the viscosity of mucus. So it thins out and enhances the flow of secretions in the respiratory tract. It, it decreases the surface tension. So um, we talked about it as a reversal agent for uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol overdose. But what we give it for more, most often is as a mucolytic. So it's usually given to clients with chronic respiratory disorders like cystic fibrosis, who have a lot of thick secretions that they need to cough out of their lungs. So some adverse drug reactions include bronchospasm and nausea. And most times the nausea is caused by the actual smell of the drug because the drug smells like rotten eggs. It is like no smell you will ever forget. It smells horrible. And when we're giving it to break up the um, the, to break up the secretions, we usually give it in a nebulizer. So we've aerosolized this drug that smells like rotten eggs and it is horrible smelling and it can cause nausea. And then the patient's coughing and if they're coughing and coughing, they can potentially aspirate or swallow some of those secretions and then they can vomit and it's just, it's horrible. Um, but it works. It's a good um, mucolytic to, to thin out those secretions. So those are the main adverse drug reaction. It can, it's also tough on the liver, which is not written here, but it is in your book. Um, so it can cause hepatotoxicity. So your interventions, obviously you need to monitor the respiratory status. If they need a bronchodilator, you can um, give a bronchodilator, but you should always have suction available. They may need an antiemetic for the nausea and I'll give them a, a paper sack to encourage uh, coughing out the secretions. Yeah, all that, all that good stuff. A lot of times in the hospital, respiratory therapy may do this because they may do some percussive therapy um, to encourage the, the coughing out of those secretions as well. But yeah, always be prepared to, to suction them if they need a bronchodilator or an antiemetic, whatever we can do to, to get those um, secretions out. And, and yeah, I like this one right here. Expect the rotten egg odor because it is nasty, 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 nasty. Um, tell the client to expect it. Lots and lots of water increase their fluid intake because we want to thin out those secretions. And interestingly enough, when we give this for a Tylenol overdose or acetaminophen overdose, when we pull it up, we give it IV. In, in that case, we give it through their IV. The vial um, that we pull the drug up from in the needle still smells like rotten eggs. So you can't get away from it even when you're giving it IV. Even though it's in a closed system, it still smells like rotten eggs. It's awful. Uh, gastric bleeding should not be used in the case of gastric bleeding and uh, should not be used in clients with asthma or bronchospasm or severe respiratory insufficiency because it can cause those uh, bronchospasms. All right, and that is what I have for you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, so that's what I have for you. And if you have any questions, of course, you can email me and I will be happy to answer with you, answer you or send me an email and uh, we can set up an appointment to meet or meet me during my office hours. Thanks.